Hi everybody, uh, my name is Sophia Sioka, and today I will be talking about something I have personally been curious about for a really long time, which is Spotify's Discover Weekly Algorithm, um, aka a whole bunch of fascinating machine learning topics all rolled up together to know your musical taste better than you do. So during this presentation, we'll first quickly review what is Spotify Discover Weekly for those of you who have not used it, and then we'll answer the big question, how it works. Specifically, we'll talk about the general data flow, and then three types of recommendation models, which is, of course, the meat of it. So, let's jump in. So this is a Spotify Discover Weekly playlist. It is specifically my Spotify Discover Weekly playlist. Uh, it is a playlist that's custom made for each of Spotify's 100 million users. And as you can see, it's got custom album cover taken from my Facebook profile picture. It's comprised of 30 songs I've never listened to before, uh, all of which Spotify believes I'll really like. And it's... You know, it turns out most of the time Spotify does a pretty amazing job choosing these 30 songs because it's pretty popular. <laughs> but why is it so popular? You know, how is it that people, you know, like it so much better than the music services of the past? Because, you know, music curation is nothing new. On our road to understanding how Spotify Discover Weekly works, let's take a look at how some of the music services of the past have done recommendations. First, there was Songza, if anyone remembers that. And later there was Beats Music. Uh, and both of these services used both the same strategy to generate the recommendations. They used manual curation, which basically meant there was some person who just decided what was going to sound good together, and then you would listen to their playlist. Simple. Then there was Pandora, uh, which was really popular. And Pandora used, um, they just manually tagged attributes. So it was slightly more complicated. Somebody would just listen to the song and tag, you know, indie, folk, drums, and then code would filter for those words. Then there was the Echo Nest, which got a little more complicated. And they used algorithms that did audio analysis and text analysis on metadata about the songs. And then Last.fm, which some of you might have used, uh, used something called collaborative filtering, which we will talk more about in a moment. So if that's how other music creation services have done recommendations, how does Spotify come up with theirs You know that are so much better, apparently? Well, let's go back for a second to this list of music services and see where Spotify fits in. Uh, first of all, like Last.fm, Spotify uses collaborative filtering. And secondly, it actually bought the Echo Nest to get access to its algorithms and data regarding audio and text. So you could say that Spotify uses three different methods, basically. Number one is collaborative filtering, which again we'll talk about. Two is text analysis, and three is audio analysis. So this is a really big, scary data flow. Um, I know it looks overwhelming, but bear with me here. This is the data flow for Spotify's recommendation engines at large, with Discover Weekly bolded right in the middle. We're actually only going to be talking about the stuff over here, um, the recommendations pipeline, which consists of the algorithmic models and the sources for them. And there are three main types of recommendation models, which we just went over at Spotify employees. Uh, the first is those collaborative filtering models. And the sources for those are your behavior and other users' behavior, which will be compared. Then there's natural language processing models, NLP, um, which is, works on text, music blogs and the internet, uh, song descriptions and all the metadata, and finally, audio models on raw audio tracks. So I've faded out the rest of the background of this graphic so we can focus on the part that's important. Um, and first, let's focus on the first model type, collaborative filtering. Um, they have two sources, play logs and track metadata, um, all coming from both yourself and other people. So when many people think of collaborative filtering, they think of Netflix. Netflix was one of the first companies to use it to power their movie recommendations model, using the stars rating that different people give movies um, to inform their understanding of what movies to recommend to other users. And actually, I guess Netflix even has a competition now for the best collaborative filtering algorithm, and these guys want it. Uh, cool. But there is a problem. Unlike Netflix, Spotify doesn't have explicit feedback, right? You don't use stars most of the time to rate the music you listen to. So instead, they use implicit feedback using your stream counts or the songs you're listening to. So this is just like a very high level look at collaborative filtering. The guy on the left is saying, hey, like, I like tracks P, Q, R, and S. And the guy on the right says, well, I like Q, R, S, and T. And collaborative filtering says, hmm, these people must be pretty similar since they like three of the same songs. So the guy on the right is pretty likely to like P, and the guy on the left is pretty likely to like T. So it'll recommend those to those people. But how does it do that with 100 million users? You know, how does it figure out which users are like each other user? That's a lot of people, right? Um, and the answer to that is matrix math. Um, and this matrix you see here, don't, don't get too 
freaked out by this, but like basically it's, this is a huge, huge matrix. It's got, on one side it's got users, um, and there are 100 million users. So every single user is in this matrix. If you use Spotify, you are in this matrix. Um, and on the other side are songs, and there are 30 million songs. So this is just mind-blowingly large. Um, and where they intersect are a bunch of ones and zeros uh, where if a user has listened to a song. So if I listened to Thriller yesterday, um, my user row, where it intersects with Thriller's song row, is going to be a one. And if I've never listened to Thriller, it's going to be a zero. And it, that makes it a pretty sparse matrix, right? Because there are way more songs that I haven't listened to than songs I've ever listened to. So there are a ton of zeros in this chart. Um, also, it's worth noting that Spotify experiments with these algorithms a lot. So they've tried using the actual play counts, like six or 12, or however many times you've listened to the song. And it kind of goes back and forth as they try and hone it to be the best it can be. So then on this algorithm, they do this really complicated equation. Um, and again, this is all done with a Python library that does this matrix math. Uh, and you end up with two vectors, a user vector and a song vector. And actually, you don't end up with just two vectors. Every user ends up with a vector, and every song ends up with a vector. And the stuff inside the vector has no semantic meaning. It's just a bunch of numbers. But when you compare it with a bunch of other users, you can see, which, like, you do a dot product, a mathematical dot product. And if you take my user vector compared to someone else's user vector, if it has a low dot product, that means we're similar. So again, done with a Python library, you can tell which users are similar. And you could also do the same for songs and see which songs are most similar. OK, so that is collaborative filtering. Um, returning to the master data flow, let's move on to the second type of recommendation model, which is NLP models, whose source data, as the name suggests, are words, track metadata, news articles, blogs, and other text. So natural language processing, or the ability of a computer to understand human speech as it's spoken, is a whole vast field unto itself. Um, some of you have explored that in your projects through sentiment analysis and things like that. And the exact mechanisms behind it are beyond the scope of the presentation, but just understand that basically Spotify scrapes the web for blog posts and other written texts about music uh, and figures out what people are saying about specific songs and artists and then analyzes that text to find what adjectives are used most often, what other artists and songs are mentioned most often alongside them. Um, and then, kind of like with collaborative filtering, it uses that to create a vector representation of the song, which can be used to compare with other songs. OK. And we've got one more model. We did collaborative filtering, we did NLP, and finally, we've got audio models, which, as you might have guessed, the source of that is raw audio files. And first, a question. Why do we need to analyze the audio itself? Right? Like we have a lot of data, you might be thinking. We just did two different kinds of um, recommendation models. The first is to improve accuracy, obviously, but the second is really important, and that's to make sure new songs are included. Because think, if there's a song that your singer-songwriter friend wrote that only has 50 plays on Spotify, um, collaborative filtering isn't going to work on it, because there are no other users, really, who have listened to it to compare with. And NLP isn't really going to work, because there are no blog posts about it or anything on the internet. So in order to make sure that it ends up in people's Discover Weeklies, the actual audio track also needs to be included. But how can we do that, right? Like, that seems really abstract to analyze an audio track. Convolutional neural networks to run over the acoustics, um, which is the same thing that's used in facial recognition. That's one of its more popular use cases. Um, and this is a kind of a diagram of how convolutional neural networks work. Again, so that's a little beyond the scope. Um, but it's basically uh, this particular neural network has four convolutional layers, uh, those four rectangles on the left half, um, and then three dense layers on the right. And basically, the input are time frequency representations of audio frames, which are basically concatenated to form this spectrogram on the left. Um, and they go through these layers. And after the last layer, you see global temporal pooling, which pools across the entire time axis to basically compare like, the whole song with itself, um, uh, computing statistics across the time of the song. And then, whoops. And then, uh, it gets put to the output layer at the very end, which predicts an understanding of the song's personality. You know, does it have a high tempo? Does it have high danceability? Um, is it acoustic? All of these characteristics can actually be found with pretty high accuracy just by running these neural networks on the audio file, which is pretty amazing. All right, so we've talked about the three major types of recommendation models feeding the recommendations pipeline and ultimately the Discover Weekly playlist. Of course, this is all connected to a much larger ecosystem, which includes giant amounts of data storage in various places and services. Uh, it uses lots of Hadoop clusters to scale it all and make these recommendation engines work on giant matrices and tons of music articles on the internet and huge numbers of audio files. Cool. And here's some additional resources in case you want to learn more. There are some really detailed looks at all of those different models if you're interested. And that's all. Thanks so much.